on in our community? Thanks for joining us on Consider the Source, where we will highlight the biggest stories from this week and hear more from our reporters bringing you the coverage. Remember, the source is online all the time, and you can find us at stthomassource.com, stcroissource.com, and stjohnsource.com. I'm your host, Adisha Penn. Now, let's get to the headlines. During Tuesday's weekly Government House press briefing, officials announced a significant advancement in implementing legal cannabis use in the USVI, with Governor Albert Bryan Jr. signing off on rules and regulations that govern the VI cannabis program. The Virgin Islands Cannabis Program is a hybrid of medicinal cannabis and adult use cannabis programs, providing special protections and benefits to medicinal cannabis users, according to officials. It is also a document that will govern the rollout of cannabis licenses and third-party vendor certification. Regulations about cannabis use in the territory were recently approved by the Cannabis Advisory Board. Bryan's support will provide more opportunities for cannabis users and prescribers to access the substance legally. Let's hear more from this week's press conference. Program. The Virgin Islands Cannabis Program is a hybrid of medicinal cannabis and adult use cannabis programs. It provides special protections and benefits to medicinal cannabis users. It also um, it, it is also a document that will govern the rollout of cannabis licenses and third party vendor certifications. Also, it outlines the duties and responsibilities of the Office of Cannabis Registry, direct the, that the director of that office, and the Cannabis Advisory Board. Anyone interested in getting involved in the program, whether as a designated caregiver, a prescribing physician, a licensee, a third-party vendor, or a consultant should reach out to the Office of Cannabis Regulation. Governor Bryan is particularly proud of what the legislature and the executive branch have done regarding the USVI's program. Um, we are the first in the country to allow for sacramental use as we recognize as a territory that there are members in our community who partake in cannabis use for sacramental purposes. While that may have been a step forward, senators this week decided not to approve the nomination of Jamila Christopher, nominated by the governor to join the Cannabis Advisory Board. Christopher told the Committee on Rules and Judiciary Friday that her experience as an official with the Tourism Department would make her an asset to the board. However, most of the committee did not feel that was enough, and she did not receive a favorable vote to move forward her nomination to the full Senate. Let's take a look. Line of questioning, uh, Ms. Christopher, what would you say would be your most valuable contribution you hope to offer to this board? Um, I would say my knowledge. Um, your knowledge on what? Um, we, we, the senators mentioned it earlier. This just act like this is a job interview. We know you have a, another paying job, but the governor nominated you to be on this, this board. And this is just part of the process to ask to see if, you know, individuals who serve on this committee feel that, yes, this is a good candidate for this board. So I ask, what is your most valuable contribution you hope to offer to this board? Tell us, let us know how we think that you are the best fit for this job. So I believe um, my knowledge into the tourism industry, my knowledge into uh, rules, applying rules and regulations, um, whether or not it's in an organization or to, um, to any rules or bylaws that may exist. After three weeks of incessant island-wide power outages that have left residents frustrated and searching for answers, the VI Water and Power Authority addressed the causes and gave updates on the disruptions during its regularly scheduled board meeting on Thursday. 
From natural causes, including a lightning strike on St. Thomas, to faulty equipment, the blackouts have stemmed from different matters, WAPA CEO Andrew Smith said of the recent string of outages. Smith told the board that the generators in the territory are 7 to 12 years past due for maintenance and should be maintained every two years, but the authority lacks the funding to do so. He also said it does not have the funds to do major maintenance for all of the units right now, but highlighted that Unit 27 recently had an assessment by an outside vendor and that a schedule of preventative maintenance is in place for all units. Smith also said that while the power outages are inconvenient, the positive side is that the outages allow for the authority to the opportunity to do preventative maintenance that can only be done when the generators are powered down. Pledging prioritized funding for maintenance, WAPA's board also asked Smith what can be done to get the authority to a zero outage scenario. Smith said that would be impossible locally, but our outages can be reduced by vegetation management, maintenance on generators, and having an inventory for spare parts for equipment would be required. All the latest stories on WAPA are posted on our site. Keep following for our updates. And Tuesday marked the official close of nomination petitions, revealing a heated race ahead with incumbents vying for re-election, former officials attempting comebacks, and a surge of new contenders, especially from St. Croix, eager to seize their chance at office. The election system released the official list of candidates late Tuesday night, tallying 43 Senate hopefuls across two districts, three for Delegated Congress, seven for seats on the Board of Education, and 14 for the Board of Elections. Additionally, 21 petitions were filed for Constitutional Convention delegates. In the St. Thomas, St. John Senate race, six incumbents have filed for re-election, joined by 11 challengers, including a few familiar faces like St. Thomas Water Island Administrator Avery Lewis. Governor Albert Bryan Jr. announced in a press release Tuesday night that he had appointed Deputy Chief of Staff Kevin Rodriguez to serve in Lewis's place temporarily as candidates must take a leave of absence from government jobs upon filing their nomination petitions. Rodriguez, according to the election system, is running uncontested as the Democratic Party's National Committee man. In the at-large Senate race, Senator St. John Senator Angel Bocas Jr. is aiming to reclaim his seat, facing a challenge from Senate hopeful Lorelei Monsanto. During a hearing Tuesday, Senator Donna Fred Gregory announced that she would not be seeking re-election. Ida Smith has filed her candidacy for a delegate to Congress, and seven have submitted petitions for Constitutional Convention delegates. Within the party ranks, three candidates have filed for district chair of the Democratic Party, five for the party's territorial district committee, and eight for the territorial committee at large. On St. Croix, incumbent Senator Javon James will not be returning to this race, though the remaining six sitting senators, Diane Capehart, Samuel Carrion, Lavelle Francis, Kenneth Gittins, Maurice James, and Franklin Johnson are. Joining the race are former Senators Oakland Benta, who also ran for Lieutenant Governor in the last gubernatorial election, along with Norman John Baptiste, Naraida Nelly O'Reilly, Genevieve Whittaker, and Kurt Violet. Additionally, 50 more petitions for Senate have been filed, with challengers including Jelani Ritter and attorney Russell Tate. In the congressional race, Delegate Stacey E. Plaskett has filed her bid for re-election, challenged by former gubernatorial candidate Ronald Picard. Fourteen candidates have filed for petitions for constitutional convention delegate. Eight candidates are vying for positions on the Board of Elections, three for the Board of Education, and within the Democratic Party, ten have filed for a spot on the Territorial District Committee, along with two candidates for Territorial Committee at large. Carol Burke has filed her petition for Senate Chair of the Democratic Party with Ophelia Williams-Jackson running for District Chair. Keep visiting our sites for election 2024 updates. And thanks for tuning in so far. We've got a lot more for you and we'll hear more from Source reporter Jesse Daly after these messages from broadcast sponsors. Liberty, your world better connected, Pizza Hut and KFC. Stay tuned after the break. Welcome back. And let's hear more from Source reporter Jesse Daly, who has details on what we can expect weather-wise in the week ahead. 
Hey, good day guys and girls, Jesse Daly here. Welcome back to your Virgin Island Source weekly weather update. For this week, beginning Sunday, May 26th through next Saturday, June 1st. Can you believe we're already into June? June is the beginning of hurricane season and we're going to talk more about that in just a minute. But first, let's look at your forecast. Okay, my friends, let's quickly look at this graphic courtesy of the Weather Channel for the weather this week, and happy Memorial Day on Monday. There will be a mix of clouds and sun along with the possibility of rain and thunderstorms, and there will be a lot of moisture around the islands this week. The National Weather Service in San Juan, Puerto Rico, has explained that a tropical wave will move across the region around Monday, and this will increase the chance of rain. I'll keep you posted on this situation over at the source weather page and please remember that the ground is very saturated so any additional rain could raise the possibility of flash flooding. Overall this week, daytime high temperatures will be in the upper 80s Fahrenheit, around 30 to 31 degrees Celsius, and nighttime temperatures will be in the low 80s Fahrenheit, around 27 degrees Celsius. The heat index, which the National Weather Service defines as being what the temperature feels like to the human body when relative humidity is combined with the air temperature, may be high in some areas across the islands this week. Heat advisories or warnings may be issued. Also, we may see some Saharan dust across the islands, and we can see a plume of dust moving across the Atlantic and toward the Caribbean on this map. And for our surfer, sailor, and swimmer friends out there, here's a look at this week's marine weather update. The ocean water temperature across Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands is currently between 85 and 86 degrees Fahrenheit, around 30 degrees Celsius. Here is a quick look at the significant wave height predictions from the global forecast system and courtesy of tropicaltidbits.com. And we can see light blue colors around the USVI in Puerto Rico, suggesting that we'll have wave heights this week of around two to five feet on most days. The National Weather Service also notes that winds and seas will be higher in areas that are near thunderstorms. And finally, for our Tropic Watch, my friends, here's a look at what's going on this week in the tropics. Saturday, June 1st, marks the official start of the 2024 Atlantic hurricane season. The National Weather Service has been monitoring an area of low pressure north of the local islands for some possible tropical development. This does not look to be extremely concerning, but I'll keep an eye on it. Also, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has released their hurricane season outlook, and it looks to be a very busy season. There is a new article about this over at the source website. My friends, now is the time to prepare for hurricane season. There's a lot of information about hurricane preparedness from the National Weather Service, and I highly encourage you to follow the Virgin Islands Territorial Emergency Management Agency for updates, including any earthquake alerts that may be issued. Guys and girls, thank you so much for watching this video. Please follow me over at the Source Weather page. That is where I'm always hanging out at. And until we meet again, live it up in the beautiful U.S. Virgin Islands and stay safe. And as always, I will keep an eye on the tropical skies come rain or shine. Thanks for that, Jesse. And on a related note, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has predicted an extremely active 2024 Atlantic hurricane season. The number of expected cyclones across the Atlantic Basin this year is the highest the agency has ever forecast. NOAA's outlook for the 2024 Atlantic hurricane season, which spans from June 1st to November 30th, predicts an 85% chance of an above normal season, a 10% chance of a near normal season, and a 5% chance of a below normal season, according to information provided from a NOAA press briefing and a press release on Thursday. Additionally, NOAA's Accumulated Cyclone Energy ACE forecast is very high, indicating a very active hurricane season. Experts are particularly concerned about the rapid intensification of cyclones this year, and residents of coastal locations by the Atlantic Ocean, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Caribbean Sea are advised to start hurricane season preparations before any storms are on the horizon. 
A tentative wage agreement signed with the Registered Nurses Leadership Union, Inc., RNLU, marks a significant step toward enhancing healthcare services in the Virgin Islands and offering more parity in salaries as the demand for nurses continues, according to officials. This agreement impacts employees hired as assistant head nurses, head nurses, nurse management, manager administrative care coordinators, and clinical care coordinators at the health department. Schneider Regional Medical Center and the Juan F. Louis Hospital and Medical Center. The previous collective bargaining agreement for the RNLU had expired on September 30, 2020, according to a government house news release. Achieving salary parity with national standards was a crucial goal of the negotiations, Chief Collective Bargaining Negotiator Josh Springett said in an interview with The Source this week. Overall, in all the nursing contracts, the government had the base by at least 25 to 30 percent to attract and retain nurses, Springett said. The new wage agreement reflects this effort with significant salary increases across various positions. For example, the assistant head nurse salary at the health department has been raised to $86,000 and $88,000 at the hospital, with expanded starting salary ranges based on experience. In the expired contract, a head nurse position could start at $80,000 but would remain in place over the length of the contract, Springett explained. She also highlighted the broader impact of these salary adjustments, particularly in retaining and recruiting talent. During the pandemic, stateside entities were offering huge signing bonuses to meet their care demands. Competitive salaries are essential for retaining and attracting more nurses, especially as the cost of living has risen significantly over the last few years, Spring has said. It's time for a quick break, but when we return, we will be sitting down with Jen Corti, aka Lady Gang, who will share more about an immersive art experience she's organizing on St. Thomas. Stay tuned after these messages from broadcast sponsors Liberty, your world better connected, Pizza Hut, and KFC. In January, Google invited students from across the United States to submit their ideas for the 16th annual Doodle for Google contest. Amidst the impressive array of submissions, one young artist from St. Thomas stood out. Harika Janwar, an 8-year-old student at the All Saints Cathedral School, was selected as one of the 55 state and territory winners, chosen from tens of thousands of entries. This year, in celebration of Google's 25th anniversary, the prompt was my wish for the next 25 years. Through their art, young artists were encouraged to share their visions for the future. The response was overwhelming, with students expressing their hopes for safer communities, technological advancements, a cleaner planet, and greater unity among people. Harika's artwork, titled Ocean in Motion beautifully encapsulated her dream of becoming a marine biologist dedicated to cleaning the litter-infested ocean. The young artist was on vacation in Texas when she received the exciting news. To celebrate the achievements of Harika and the other winners, Google provided each of the 55 students with Google hardware and swag. Now Harika is competing in a national contest. Five national finalists have been chosen, one of whom will become the national winner. Look up this story on our websites for the link to vote. Voting ends on June 4th. Good luck, Harika. And in our guest segment this week, source reporter Ananta Pancham got the chance to sit down with Jen Corti, who has been busy organizing an immersive art experience on St. Thomas this week. The show kicks off this Thursday. Let's hear more. Thank you, Adisha, and welcome back, viewers. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Consider the Source. And we have with us Jen Cordy, AKA Lady Gang, who is dressed fabulously today. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I'm not sure if she does this every day, <laughs> but she is here dressed as an astronaut for a very particular reason. And it's because she's going to tell us more about her immersive art experience coming up on St. Thomas on Thursday at Tillet Garden, which is also an album release mm -hmm. uh, en encompassing art, film, music, all of the things. All of the things. All of the things. So tell us about what you have coming up. So um, I've partnered with Amy Gibbs and Art Uncorked VI oh, yeah. to create an immersive art experience, which means we are putting you into a world that we are creating and building through giant art pieces like we made 25 jellyfish, we're making six foot cactus, we're turning the stage into a spaceship, um, creating a, a beautiful jungle space for the fire dancers, live music, DJs, food. We want to 
put you in the world that we're creating to receive the art, basically, to receive the feeling of the album and to receive the feeling of the film that goes along with the album. So tell us about the film and the album itself. Okay. How long have you been working it, working on it, and what what's involved? What's your theme? What's your what's your inspiration? Okay. Um, so I, I originally was writing two different things. I thought I was writing a show for a planetarium called Ascension, which was essentially the journey of an astronaut that falls from space into the ocean and floats all the way to the deepest part and dies, and uh, the journey that it would take to become an ancestor, ah. essentially. Um, and then as I came to St. Thomas, I've been coming to St. Thomas since 2012. I lived here in 2012, and I've been trying to get back for a really, really long time. And my music started to shift. Um, I went to Puerto Rico, where my family's from. I'm eight generations from Puerto Rico. It's also where all my music comes from, is my grandfather. And started writing music in Puerto Rico, music here in St. Thomas. Uh, I went to uh, Baja California Sur in Mexico last year and spent the winter there with the whales and started writing music there. So I really created this album called The Brave Traveler and realized that The Brave Traveler was the second half of Ascension. So I'm combining them both. So the film is the story of the astronaut that falls from space into the ocean. And then the album begins. And the rest of the film is me playing in Mexico, me playing here in St. Thomas, me playing in Puerto Rico, traveling around as the brave traveler, seeking, seeking art and community and creation. I love that because that's exactly, and it's no secret that we're huge fans of Amy Gibbs up in here. Um, I know that that's what Amy is always looking to build with her events, mm -hmm. um, creating a community around art. So mm -hmm. that's really incredible. So I think maybe my next question is what's next after the immersive art show for you? So it's my last show on I Island. It's also, again, the album release for The Brave Traveler. And then I head back to the States. Mm -hmm. I'm going to back to Texas, to Colorado, Wyoming, New Mexico, Texas. Um, and then I'll return here for about a month. And then I leave again and go back to Baja, go back to Mexico for three, maybe six months. Uh, there's more filming to be done, more music to be written. The journey continues. We'll see if there's a Brave Traveler 2 or what the next chapter is. Okay. And you're wrapping up the documentary with this event or mm -hmm. on your travels to Well, this I, this I feel like is the first. It's a beta test, really. Yeah. It's a beta test. It's, it's two years that I've been working on this, two years of writing the story, of the story unfolding. So it feels full circle for me that I would have the Ascension Party or the Ascension Immersive Exhibit here in St. Thomas. Um, with the community that we've built here. So I do feel like it's a full circle thing and I'm kind of jumping into the current of the unknown to see what's next for me. Yeah, all mm -hmm. right. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> so Thank tell, you. Us, tell us the again the details of the event okay. and how people can, is it free? It is free. We, wanted, we really think um, art should be accessible and, and should be free. So it is a free event. There will be food offered that night, drinks offered that night. Um, it starts at 7 promptly is when the show begins, but the pre-show starts at 5.30. So we have a, a DJ from 5.30 to 6.30, Latin percussion group from 6.30 to 7, and then the show itself begins at 7. All right. Mm -hmm. All right, St. Thomas, come out. Even come if you're out. not on St. Thomas, St. John, St. Yeah, Floyd, fly out. over. Um, Jen, can't wait to see you, and we can't wait to welcome you. We'll be covering that event, so stay tuned. And back to you, Adisha. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this Sunday. We can't wait to catch up with you here next week. Until then, stay safe and stay informed. Remember the source is online all the time. Keep visiting our sites for around the clock community coverage and tune in on social for updates at the top of each hour. Until next time, I'm Adisha Penn.